being uh, shared here today and the, the days uh, before. So uh, first of all, uh, we, we would like just to remember that uh, you have uh, exposed here many ideas about uh, the quantum and mechanical aspects of uh, the hard probes, in particular of the jets and the Quarkonia, and how quantum computing uh, could uh, potentially provide tools to perform the needed calculations. From the, from the talks, we selected some of the slides. Uh, the first talk, if I remember well, was uh, by Yassin, he, uh, where he tweeted the possibility um, to use the, the light front formulation uh, in order to study uh, the evolution of the, the jets in the presence of a quark uh, plasma and the entanglement, the thermalization, the color randomization, and also he spoke about the, the possibility to use the open quantum systems as an alternative approach. So I don't know if you have any uh, comment on this already, because what, what we would like to do is to, to propose the discussion. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, okay. so, yeah, yeah. So, so this is a round table discussion. This is a round table. Yeah. Yeah. So, so everyone... we start with Jacin yeah. when uh, with uh, his ideas that he proposed, and also a uh, with the two uh, uh, efforts that he commented on, on his uh, talk about the, the simulation of the Libla equation for hard probes and thermal bags, uh, and the one based on the work by Joao and Carlos Salgado uh, on the uh, momentum broadening. So I don't know if, uh, Joao, do you want to comment something about your work or someone else? Or I, if not, I go on, but please interrupt me us at any moment yeah. uh, yes. follow we, uh, yes Miguel. no we had well we had a discussion with with nas and one after the all which maybe is relevant is uh, about the fact that in the in the algorithm of joao you actually have a quantum system in, interacting with a with a classical bit right if i understand Yes, so in, in I mean in this mm -hmm. uh, so th this this uh, what's it, this approach is very essentially is just like uh, is just what uh, is can just, you hear him? Oh yes. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so the the way this is done, or I mean the, the generic idea, which is I mean it's not as developed as the other one because the other one they can they actually make a simulation. So this the way this is done is essentially just to translate to translate all the Visual language that we use in the MPS approach of jet quenching into the quantum quantum computer language. I mean that's it. So in this in this way, essentially half of the system is quantum, which is the jet itself, but then the other part is classic. This is why essentially you have a quantum computer that simulates jet evolution, and then if you want to embed it in a in a background that is classical and has some statistical properties, then you have to couple it to the to the classical computer, which is uh, different of the, um, the open quantum system approach where everything is quantum in some sense. And then when you trace out, you make the, the background classical. Yes. Well, it's, it's interesting because uh, actually there, there should be a way to make the connection, though, like yeah, I mean, between uh, the, the two things that it shouldn't be too, I, I think too the, complicated. Um, Yes, I mean, I think what would, uh, I mean, not at this level, but what would maybe be important to understand is how to connect, for example, Harun's uh, approach to jet quenching to the more traditional approach of it. Because at least, yeah, I mean, at least for me and maybe for other people that are more, uh, that usually work in the more traditional frameworks, it's diff uh, difficult to see exactly where one matches the non results and when one departs from the. What, what is already known or what, what is known so far. But okay, I mean, this is my, this is my view, of course. I don't know what other people think, what Yasin or Felix or Michel Jun. I don't know if Arun is here today. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I also asked uh, Shua on this previously. So, so if you see the figure on the screen, the right one, so there's a blank block. So that's yes. where the classical 
background field enters to the quantum state in the upper of the figure. Yeah, so the treatment in this work falls into the category of the trotterization uh, for the time evolution part. So that is, um, uh, so what Xinbo talked in the uh, application of doing a uh, time evolution is also similar using this idea. And also Henry also mentioned this in the trotterization. So that's the idea of doing the time evolution on the quantum circuit. Yes, yeah, so I want to emphasize again, so this is a round table discussion. So, <laughs> so everyone is- Not only, uh, not only among the yeah, four of us. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, just feel free to interrupt yes, anytime. Switch your, the, unmute the yourself. Yes. Yeah. So I, I actually have a question for Andrew. I didn't ask because there were too many questions. But, uh, uh, so my, uh, maybe I'm wrong, but my, my impression was always that although uh, theoretically prioritization is not the optimal uh, way to implement an operator that, I mean, these other approaches, some of them supposedly are slightly better. For physical Hamiltonians or for most of the systems that we look at, uh, it turns out that totalization is uh, performed as almost as well as it. I mean, but maybe this part of my impression why people usually use totalization on top of the fact that, uh, as you said, totalization is kind of methodical and actually you can see more explicitly the symmetries of the Hamiltonian in some sense. Well, the other one, this is not always guaranteed as far as I know. Yeah, um, I, I, I mostly put that slide in there to be provocative and to have people talking about it exactly like this. The, the big thing about Trotter, I would say, is that when people talk about the air bounds of Trotter, they're almost always asking, what is the possible error on any eigenstate that you're capable of simulating. So they, they literally just say, the air in your Trotter simulation is bounded by the largest air on any eigenstate. And the eigenstates that typically have the largest air are the highest eigenvalues. And so in the, like, the lattice field theory language, what this is saying is, if you try and compute a cutoff scale eigenstate, it's going to have a gigantic error to it. And therefore you should be doing much, much finer lattices so that your cutoff effects are being treated better. Now, if I'm doing a lattice QCD calculation, I never care about lattice cutoff effects. Those are always known to be unphysical, unimportant states to me. And all I care about is the IR states, like the very, very low energy ones. And if all you care about is those ones, then all of a sudden your bounds on your trotter error go from being the norm of the entire Hamiltonian matrix to the norm of the eigenvalues at much, much lower energies. And so there's been a very small amount of work uh, by a few people saying, if you only consider the error bounds of the low energy states of a Hamiltonian, you find that the error rates are one, much, much smaller than the naive estimates people are giving. And two, you get much, much closer to what you actually observe when what you do in your state prep is preparing a low energy state. Because again, the low energy states are the ones that are actually interesting. Where low energy means the ones that are far away from where you know you have numerical errors. So, that's sort of the state of understanding in trotterization at the moment is the reason these errors seem so much worse than other ideas is those other ideas are subtly taking into account that you know, you're sort of optimizing for the state that you were doing time evolution with. Whereas the trotter error bounds are thinking about any possible state you could have prepared. Whereas if you restricted yourself in the same way to, I'm doing a particular state preparation, you will find that trotter errors are much, much better than the naive estimates. And you get something in line with what you actually physically observe. So it, it, in the same way, it's not clear to me that I'm going to actually gain a whole lot from choosing a much more elaborate time evolution operator, given that I'm then going to give up the sort of formal understanding I have of Trotter, and that the Trotter errors are certainly not as bad as advertised most of the time. But these, I think it's still something worth exploring, because it, some of these methods have genuine like, computational complexity arguments that they should be much, much better than they are turning out at the moment. But that's a matter of you have to optimize for your special theory. And given that no one's thought about quantum field theories enough, it's unclear how big those optimizations could be. Uh, so just one other question as a follow-up. I'm not sure I can formulate it very clearly, but if I'm not interested in asymptotic scalings, but I just want to implement you know, some algorithm in a small scale computer, 
Do you think that uh, going from turtle scheme to some other scheme to implement the evolution operator will matter that much if I'm not interested in, uh, you know, if I just want to do it in a small scale computer? Um, it, I, I think it's really going to matter what your theory is. Like the, the theories that people talk about, like the, the one dimensional spin chains where people have shown really, really well that they get lots of speed ups from these like other approaches are the ones that are clearly much more amenable to a, a small system, a computer, right? So if, if you're, if you're thinking about doing something on a small computer, you're inherently thinking about a smaller scale problem and you get sort of like secret benefits from that, like simpler theories have sometimes secret advantages with algorithms that don't scale up to a more complicated theory, right? Like the difference between abelian theories and non-abelian theories is that you have gluon gluon interactions, but that secretly makes all of your computational simulations dramatically harder because the Hamiltonian is a much denser matrix and things like that. So I think it's, it will not be because the system, the computer is smaller that you would find benefits to the other things that are greater than for a large scale asymptotic scaling. But it may be that the problems you're restricted to studying is secretly giving you a benefit in some algorithms over other ones. And that's something that one has to, on a model by model, inspect what's going on and why you're succeeding. Okay, thanks. So uh, in this uh, in these slides from Yasin, he advised us to see a Felix talk. So let's go to Felix. Uh, well, here uh, is the applicability of quantum simulations to open quantum systems, which is, I, I guess, uh, has been the, the main subject of the, of the conference. And uh, Felix introduced the quantum algorithm for the non-unitary evolution and also the simulation in IBMQ. So, uh, do you have any comment on this particular uh, introduction about the quantum simulations and the open quantum systems? We are going to go on with the, with the open quantum systems afterwards, mm -hmm. but apply to Quarkon. So if you want to, to comment now on this, if not, we go ahead. Uh, I mean, I have <laughs> a question. Uh, but it's, I mean, it's for you, I seen from, it's not in the slide, but so Yasin, you showed in, uh, I think in one of the slides that you were working on this uh, essentially density matrix formulation yes. for jet quench, uh, if I remember correctly. But then, uh, I mean, I understood what you were doing, but then, I mean, besides the limit where you recover the, where the, I mean, essentially the, where you go back to the, to the classical limit for, for the mediums, what, which other limits can you compute besides uh, numerically? Uh, I mean, uh, you didn't show it probably because you, you have not gone so far, but do you have an, an idea what could be done there? Well, I mean, the uh, the calculation was very simple. I mean, uh, you know, it was, uh, you know, particle, con particle conserving, you know, evolution, so no radiation. So uh, very quickly, uh, you, 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 you know, you tend towards this uh, classical behavior, right? So you get this kind of uh, really standard uh, momentum broadening, you know, classical momentum broadening. Of course, you can study really the early times and the onset of that uh, kind of color randomization, right? You can do that, right? So you see, you can really solve the, the entire, you know, uh, quantum mechanical problem. Uh, well, I mean, for the reduced density metrics, right? So you take the reduced density metrics and then you can solve the, uh, the, the the evolutions uh, whether it's the lin blad or you know the, the the full evolution for the density metrics and then you would get you would get this transition towards that uh, kind of classical behavior but i think what's really what become the challenge and interesting is when you start really looking at the uh, you know you know multi, you know multiple partners partonic systems right so when the jets start evolving and so that's why i mean what i showed was pretty simple so to speak and, you know, I don't think there's really anything really uh, very uh, deep or anything else you could do, you know expect from that. So also, if if uh, if it's a single particle that you start with, you really don't get any octagonal matrix elements, right? Say again. If if you start with a single particle state, say momentum eigenstate, and evolve it, then you probably only get diagonal matrix elements, right? Do right, you actually right. get 
of diagonal elements at all in the evolution. Right, exactly, exactly, exactly. So this by setting yourself in the uh, initially in the say a, a specific uh, a momentum state, then uh, the, uh, the 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 system stays diagonal. Right. Um, for the color space, it's uh, less uh, you know straightforward. So there will be a uh, you know some color randomization, but for momentum space, that's correct. Um, yeah, but you uh, by looking at uh, you know, this is a different state, right? Maybe you could imagine a wave function, you know, initialize the system in a broader, you know, uh, momentum, uh, you know, configuration, uh, then, uh, then, uh, then you, 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 you still expect classicalization at later times. Uh, yeah, so so I, yeah, yeah, go on. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's that's pretty much what I want to say. So you still ex expect some kind of roughly diagonal system, right? Because you have you would have like the like classical transverse momentum would be very large compared to the kind of wiggle room of the quantum physics. So the the tra trajectory would become roughly classical, uh, and and the classical description would, would be really uh, pretty uh, good, right? Uh, so think of it this way. The way I think of it is so when kt increases, right, due to momentum broadening. So any any initial transverse momentum, even if you have the you know wave function, which is wave packet, which is kind of broad, you, you it will look like a delta function for the very high kt mode that you will probe after multiple scattering. So yeah, so 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 you expect that even if I start with all of diagonal general wave function, which is superpositions of several momentum eigenstates. You expect right. it will eventually diagonalize in you know, the moment. Right, it's, it's simply so, because of, you have a large separation of scales, right? You, you build your separation of scales. So the KT initially is uh, you have a wave packet, right? Uh, you have off diagonal uh, metrics elements there, but then multiple scatterings will increase the KT, right? And uh, and uh, and of course, yeah. But that's that. The the question now is when this would happen, right? When you would expect really full. You know, a classical uh, behavior or or really a re suppression of quantum uh, effects. So I can't really answer uh, for that. But you know, the 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 infinite time limit, right? That's that's the what I'm kind of uh, uh, advocating here. That it, it has to tend to a more like a would be well described by diagonal uh, metric element. Yeah. So so can, can we sort of say that the, the medium is sort of forcing a particular basis, right? It, it's like you have a pointer basis in some sense. Right, or, yes. or, and that's because of the presence of the medium, right? Right, right. I think so. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah. Now the question is whether whether the diagonalization happened in other bases. Uh, you know, that's that's the yeah. That's what I was asking. That whether the the medium is enforcing the momentum eigen basis as the pointer basis. Right, right. For, for your decoherence in some sense. Yeah. Miguel, Miguel wants to. Uh, no, no. I just wanted to say that we have an example of this diagonalization happening in a very similar problem in the talk of uh, Paul Gossio, in which he showed that the density matrix, he started with some density matrix. Yeah. And he showed explicitly my numerical evaluation that it turns diagonal, except for a little point at the very center. Mm -hmm. Let me check if you want. We don't have the slides. Yeah, but I, I we have the slides. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Yes, it's here. It was here. What you mean, I guess, is, 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 okay, here, okay, yeah, yeah, at the end. Yes, in this yeah. one, this, this, these are the yeah. kind of floats, yes. right? Yes, I think so. Right. So, yes. yeah. so no, what no. does this, uh, the, 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 the different axes uh, stand for? Sorry. Well, I think it's the previous, maybe the previous one. And these are uh, positions in the, this is the density matrix. And I, I guess uh, one axis is the 
right of the density matrix and on axis is the left of the density matrix. And you start right. from, from a position in which the diagonal well, is symmetric in a sense. If, so you want, have, if you want ah, just... Uh, yeah, you have non is fully quantum. I mean, you see you have a non-diagonal elements. In fact, it's spheric. And after 20 Fermi, you get something that is very much diagonal. Right? That is Why would you diagonal. say that the initial the initial condition is is, is uh, in a very uh, yeah it's kind of but localized no maybe Hohen sort said that what what I mean is that it's clearly non diagonal right and diagonal means that you know that the position in the right and the left and the density matrix is the same so you could say that it, you can say that the system has a classically localized position well this as the evolution goes you see that it becomes diagonal right although he also mentioned that there is a uh, something strange surviving uh, in yeah. the surviving in the yes yeah. Okay, I, I just wanted to mention. Just, okay. just, just quick. Is, is this, is this, uh, this is a position space density matrix, is that right? Like this yes. variable yes. S. Exactly. Yes. yes. So and this is for a particular problem that it goes yeah, to yeah. this particular basis. And so, I mean, I so what you see, or what once I read, like the the pointer basis. Or I don't know. Is it obvious that the pointer basis in in Yaxine's case is momentum space? But right then, we would want to look at this in in momentum spaces. So. Yeah, so are you saying that the point of basis here is positions, position basis? Is, is that is that what the conclusion is? No, I guess. Problem? Yeah. No, I, I guess it's just plotted in momentum. Uh, sorry, it's plotted in position space. Um, right, so I, I'm not sure I interpret this correctly. So are we saying that at t is equal to 20 for me, we are claiming that the density matrix is diagonal or it is not? In the position basis. I don't know. It's, I guess it's not fully diagonal, right? Well, I don't know what would happen like at later times, right? I guess that's where you sort of, I guess not fully decohere the system, right? I, I would think. Yeah, so I was just trying to interpret the plot. Are those, are those, is the spreading an indication of the fact that you have off diagonal elements? Is that what we're saying? Nice. Oh. I, I guess at, at the beginning you have more off diagonal, right? Then. No, yeah. you know, it, it really depends on the basis, right? In the beginning, you only have a one S state. If you use the eigen energy states as the basis, then you have a diagonal density matrix. Well, it depends on what basis, right? Again. Yeah. This isn't position basis, so I'm not sure. <laughs> if it's an energy eigen state, then why should it be diagonal? No, no, no. I mean, the initial state is diagonal because he, he, he's citing on the slide, it's, they start with a one S wave function, but yeah, after 20 Fermi over C, then it's not clear. You mean it's I mean, mixing it different matrix. states, like one S and, and others? It's mixing those, or is it just a position that changes the function of time? I mean, it, it, you, you get the density matrix in space uh, basis. You can, you can convert that basis into another basis, and then you can tell if you still have the one S V function there. You can also tell how many of the one S V functions have turned into unbound states? No, but I would say that it, yeah. if it is close to diagonal in the coordinates basis, it's not going to be a diagonal in the bound in the bound state basis or in the Hamiltonian yeah. eigenvalue, pretty much because you, I mean, in an eigenvalue you have a long, a strong non-diagonalities in the coordinate basis. Oh, do I understand this correctly? So as long as you have only pure states in your ensemble, then the density matrix is diagonal. No, 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 no. not necessarily. No, 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 you can no, choose no. the basis to make it diagonal and it becomes one zero 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 all the way to the dimension of the density matrix if you have a pure state. And if you cannot be written as a I mean, the density matrix is Hermitian and you can always diagonalize it. And the question is whether it's a mixed state or it's a pure state. 
And, and that depends on the number of non-zero diagonal elements you have. I don't understand. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I thought the density matrix, the, the basic, so each basic states are different pure state. It, that's not that way. So each basic state have different quantum number. Yes, but, but each basic state is a pure state. Yeah, so I mean, if, so, so if you're looking at the ensemble and the, uh, so each state, they have the same number. So it's the same pure state, not mixed state. Then the yes. density matrix would be diagonal, right? I mean, if they have the same quantum number, yes, they are, then they are the same state. Yeah, I mean, you, you should have called that to different bases. Yeah, I mean, the density matrix is always the diagonal in, in some bases, but there are uh, problems that will, I mean, if you start with a given density matrix, you mm. will tend to end up with a density matrix. The evolution will make the density matrix diagonal in a particular basis. Mm -hmm. that's, that's what the, what I think the, the plot of Paul was, was okay. showing. That's, yeah. For that particular problem, you always go Take. to the coordinate basis. So if you have off diagonal term in the density matrix, it means you have uh, different pure states in the ensemble. Do I understand yes, that correctly? Okay. Okay. Should, should yes, we, okay. We went off short. <laughs> <laughs> Uncle Bernardo is not here, yeah. it's a pity. So uh, uh, then uh, we like it very much, this slide, because uh, this slide and the following one by uh, Akamatsu, since uh, it's kind of a review on the applicability of uh, open quantum systems uh, for the Quarkonium case. And uh, in particular here, uh, in this workshop, uh, this one and this one were uh, treated here. The, the Quarkonium Libra equations uh, in the complex potential and in the uh, uh, potential energy CD. And let me show you, okay, yeah, the simulations that were presented were uh, this one in the, the quantum state the diffusion me method and the other one uh, presented by uh, Mike and Nora on the quantum jump here. So let me remember you some of the results that were on the, on the, on the first approach uh, here uh, we have illustrated the approach by the results on the complex potential and on the evolution of the eigenstate of occupation with and without dissipation. I don't know if uh, some of you want to comment or not. If not, we go to, to the jump, to the jump, the quantum jump. That was, was discussed firstly by Mike and uh, where a simulation was already uh, completed. Here you have the results. He, Mike also proposed uh, upgrades for the future in the, uh, for next to living order. Mm -hmm. And uh, Nora also presented results on this uh, quantum jump approximation. And she also uh, proposed some questions that we, we took uh, in order to, to discuss with you. One of the questions by Nora was, uh, uh, she, she said that provided that we manage to obtain determination of cap and gamma far from equilibration, and uh, that uh, we managed to get an estimation uh, of the self energy. So, is there any way to solve the full master equations that are non Glimblad type in this case? That is a question that lie on the table. Um, a more concrete question was uh, concerning this uh, method uh, based on quantum trajectory for solving Glimblad. If 
uh, there is something that can be better adapted to, to, to a quantum algorithm. This, uh, I don't know if, uh, because I was not yeah. attending Nora's uh, talk, if uh, this uh, answers, uh, uh, these questions were already answered or not, but I think. No, I think we, we uh, well, I, I guess by, well, by, by non limbrat the question, I, I think she, she meant uh, like evolution for, for open quantum yes. systems that are not Markovian, right? Yes. That, uh, the quantum trajectories. The trajectories mm -hmm. Yes. Mar is Mar yes. Is, is still the Mar 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 also, uh, uh, in, in her talk, uh, she remembered the fact that all the discussion uh, um, uh, developed there could be applied to jets. Mm -hmm. And uh, she, she said uh, to see the talk by Barun. Barun didn't put the talk uh, on either, it's not uh, accessible in YouTube, but we find this slide from uh, Initial States which is also, again, a, a, an illustration on, on the applicability of the uh, open quantum systems uh, for jets. Mm -hmm. I don't know if any of you have a... a um, I wanted a to, to comment on the second point. Um, so, okay. um, we write down a PWCD. Hey. This is, uh, in a sense, uh, the non-relativistic... Uh, quantum theory, the level of quantum mechanics that is uh, derived from quantum uh, theory. So it has a Schrodinger equation uh, as a zero order problem, but then it has also corrections that contain uh, the typical uh, quantum theory effect, like Lan shift, the retardation, and so on. This, uh, the, the Hamiltonians that correspond to PNR positive and the Lagrangian are such that uh, when you put in a path integral formalism, uh, they are renormalizable and living order differently from the relativistic OCD. So I, this is typically the Hamiltonian that one should use uh, as a non-relativistic discretion. So I wonder if, uh, Quantum computing could use this Hamiltonian in their calculation. Uh, so the quantum computing is based on this uh, Hamiltonian method. And here we are providing, the effective theory is providing you with uh, a good starting point for the Hamiltonian. That would be helpful in any way, could be yeah. used. Yes. I mean, in a sense, in non relativistic QCD is easier than QCD because you go from a V spinner to a spinner. I don't know if this is, would be a, a, a simplification in, to write uh, because at ah, the end of the day, you, you need to write a Hamiltonian that mimics what uh, your quantum field theory is doing, right? Right. I guess and the system is inherently non-relativistic. Uh, on the other end, this is not an approximation. This is what you get from quantum field theory. On top of that, uh, the leading uh, problem, the leading uh, piece of the Lagrangian in PNR QCD is normalizable, while in non-relativistic QCD is a leading problem. So you cannot go to the continuum. So I wonder if uh, it would be conceivable to use a fetish in theory to define the Hamiltonian that you are going to use, and then use this Hamiltonian to do what you want. So Nora, I want to kind of clarify a little bit more your question. Like when you see using the PR and QCD Hamiltonian, do you keep the electric field, the chrome electric fields as a dynamical degrees of freedom? Yeah. Or yeah, yeah, thank you. Thanks I see. Lot. Yeah. Thanks okay. a lot. Yes, yes, right, right. Uh, pre precisely this very important uh, point, Sayuna, because that's a, is a field in QCD. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Then I'm not an expert in quantum computing, of course. So maybe this question is naive, but uh, <laughs> if you want an Hamiltonian to start with at a non relativistic level, that could be a good testing point. Yeah, I think the non relativistic system is easier. The tricky part is a gauge sector because um, the dynamics of the electric field is also is governed by the gauge sector of, of the PNR QCD. And then um, I, I think it, it, it is connected with uh, Henry's uh, like biggest subgroup of, of SU3 gauge theory. Maybe 
um, like he, he, uh, following his approach, maybe one needs to first find out what the electric field corresponds to in that biggest subgroup, biggest discrete subgroup, obviously. Sure, one could start from Kenner to AB. This is very ah. similar to atomic physics. Let's give yeah. it a few cents because this is really atomic physics. So Kenner to AB is describing the in theory atomic physics. Or this uh, uh, the R T is as a. Mm -hmm. So, if, if I could interject and say something, um, so because you're doing non-relativistic physics. Hamiltonian, in fact, like the type of operators you're allowed are only restricted by, you know, Galilean symmetry as opposed to like Lorentz symmetry. So the possible interactions are larger. And also because you're doing, you know, effective field theory on top of like, like QCD itself has a very small number of interactions, but in our QCD, you've integrated out some degrees of freedom. So you've got a lot larger number of terms. So in fact, the Hamiltonian naively will be like, in terms of like, a computer thinking about it, it's much, much denser, in fact, than the, the QCD Hamiltonian in terms of the relative, like the number of basis states that have interactions between them. They, they, so in they, fact, it they, might they, be a harder one on a quantum computer. <laughs> the effective field theory is such, it's not relativistic effective field theory, but it maintains Poincare invariance. So all the symmetry is there. You just realize in a different way. Yeah. Right, but, but I think that, but that, that different way, plus the fact that you've integrated out degrees of freedom, is going to mean that the Hamiltonian itself is much denser. So yeah. it, it's not at all clear to me that it would be an easier or harder one in terms of circuit depth or density, okay. but it's it, it should be looked into. But my yeah. naive guess would be, in fact, it's a denser Hamiltonian. No, but in, I mean- What do you mean with denser Hamiltonian? Like, 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 it, like if, you, if you imagine all the possible basis states you would put in as like the, the, the computational basis states you would be considering, my guess would be that the number of them that interact with each other in terms of like, non-zero transition matrix elements between your basis states is much, much larger in PQCD than it is, or P in RQCD than in QCD itself. Because QCD itself, you know, there's only, you know, five or six interactions, which means that certain states just are completely decoupled for sure. But now, so now, now in, our, in our QCD will benefit because there are fewer basis states, right? Because I don't have to consider all the possible, you know, states that QCD allows. I only need to consider non-relativistic states. Right. But the states that you are left with will be much, much more likely to have non-zero elements between them. Yeah. No, but, but actually, it's, it's many ways is a correct stopping point if you want to describe a non-relativity system. If you if you want to uh, get a QCD with all the light stars uh, in your quantum computing, I mean uh, that, that's. But, you, if you uh, don't reduce to the correct uh, shock space. Uh, there is a lot, you are gaining a lot because you have only two degrees of freedom that are heavy. So I, I, I wouldn't, uh, of course, uh, you may be right, but uh, if I don't buy it. Okay. Right. And actually, I mean, the problem that the Hamiltonian will be denser, I mean, it's not so clear to me because, uh, I mean, you have an infinite number of terms, but they are not equally big. So depending the precision that you are aiming, you will only take a few of them. So for many applications- Right, right, right. but, but, but you, so you have to be very, very careful with that though, right? This is the story of Chi PT, right? Which is the perturbative Hamiltonian looks very nice and you, you would think you have an ordering of terms. And then the second you try and diagonalize that Hamiltonian, all of a sudden those, what you thought were perturbatively suppressed corrections end up becoming much, much bigger problems in the non-perturbative Hamiltonian. And that is what you might worry about here as well. Well, no. I don't know what I, again, in our, in, in our QCD has much better scale separation, but it should not be taken for granted that that could become an issue. Okay. Well, nothing can be taken for granted, of course, but uh, I don't see this problem. Of course, you may be true, but uh, there is a large parameter, which is a mass uh, that is separating. You are, you are really uh, in, a, in, a, in a given Fox space with only two heavy quarks, and this is uh, really reducing the problem a lot. I mean, if your problem is inherently non relativistic, you shouldn't put uh, all the stars, the relativistic stars uh, around. That's, uh, and then one could try with PNRQED, and PNRQED is really atom system. So if you are doing uh, things with uh, the Z level should be very similar. So where quantum computing should be similar to the system. And so it, to me, it would be interesting. Okay. 
Maybe we can also add one, just one one comment. I mean, I think Shoujun and I we discussed about this at some point, and I, I mean, we didn't, you know, spend spend too much time thinking about it. But at least it seemed to us that, in, at least in some cases, you can reduce it maybe to something that's more like quantum chemistry, right? So that's basically what you're saying, right? that it's more like a like a non-relativistic system, and, and at least in certain approximations, maybe one can sort of make use of the. Um, technology that was like developed in, in you know quantum right. chemistry um but but of course like I, I don't think we like you know thought about it that much right and <laughs> so so it's of course possible that uh uh you know that that's not as simple right um uh, as, as henry suggested right um but at least like when, when we briefly looked at it you know for a little while um we thought that one could make this connection that of course um would be very nice because it would be much more tractable right then so um you know the full thing right but of course that may be wrong right? also because it is the same stuff that you are using an atomic system so it's fascinating from that point of view qcd is more complicated i have no idea but starting with pnr qed of course in pnr qed we have perturbation theory so it's not so relevant but still studying pnr qed at finite t yes, that would be interesting yeah yeah right right but it's, it's totally possible that, that we you know overlook something. So <laughs> but I just wanted to oh, mention yeah, yeah. That, that that there may be. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, but do, do not let anything I just said detract you from this. I think it's something that needs to be explored. <laughs> I was just pointing out, like, if, if I were going into this, those would be the first questions I would try and figure out is like, how much denser do I think the matrix was going to be? Like, that would be an important question to ask. I think, right, I think right, in fact, right. P and RQC probably very much there's something on a quantum computer to be done with it. It's just not clear to me what it is. And those are sort of the first questions I would what would like to know the answers to before you, you got too involved in other things. Sure, sure, sure. Right, 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 right. right. Makes sense, makes sense. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So we have also, um, ah, select, yeah. The light front approach uh, to hadron structures with quantum computing because, well, here you have a very good uh, example of a quantum simulation and you can do in fact meson spectroscopy by it's, it's very nicely illustrated here i don't know if uh, you have any comment on either of uh, these uh, two quantum simulations and possibilities and so on mm -hmm. yeah with this procedure i think the green part that's I think that's the optimization of uh, the loop. The loop, the loop yeah. yeah, yeah. So some part is by classical uh, computer. I think the green part. So the, the green part is classical. Yeah, the, yeah. The the quantum is just here. Yeah. So the optimization is done on the classical computer. I wonder, is it possible to also do that on the quantum computer instead of classical computer, the optimization part also. Yeah, I, I didn't, I didn't, oh, so I didn't the, pick up the, the, op the optimization part is yes, not on yes, the classical yes. computer. Yeah, okay. Is it possible also to do that okay. part on quantum computer? Okay. Hmm. Like what's the major difficulty for that? Or is there any work? Yes, yeah. Yeah, yeah, in yeah. that direction, I don't know. Yeah. That, that is very different, right? Like in, mm. on the computer, we can do unitary time evolution or we can do measurements. But those kind of optimization relies on, you know, the standard procedure. You define some cost function. You calculate a, a gradient when you change the parameters of your model. And you, you calculate those gradients. You, you want to go to a direction that minimizes your cost function. Um, yes. Yeah, I, I don't know how to formulate that as a Hamiltonian evolution. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I agree. Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, I would say if, if you're willing to give up on the sort of, you know, digital quantum computer, this is exactly what, you know, quantum annealers are all about, right? This is what D-Wave yeah. is supposed to be living the dream of is it does the optimization and the state prep finding for you in one big step, which is just finding the ground state of whatever Hamiltonian you've mapped on. So if you're willing to move yourself into you know, a completely different paradigm of quantum compute computation, you can do all of it on the quantum computer at once. But then how you take that information and move it to, you know, a digital quantum computer to use for like time evolution and measuring things is a lot harder to see. Mm -hmm. So you, you need like, you need like a D-Wave hooked up to IBM in some in clever way. Okay. 
Okay. And I think, ah, yeah, for, from today, from today we took uh, this, uh, this pictures uh, for the, just for the background of the quantum computer that uh, Simbo is playing, uh, made a, a nice uh, resume or introduction or, and also for the trotter decomposition. And we took the, the two pictures. That has been already discussed today, but if you have any 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 other comment or question, please. Oh, about the totalization, I think this is one thing I learned from discussion with Wen Yang. So one concern about uh, the totalization is that so you decompose the time evolution into many time steps, right? So you do the evolution. <laughs> evolution on the quantum circuit. So one problem that may face is you have a very long quantum circuit. So you have a lot of quantum gates on the circuit and that can be expensive to have a computation on the quantum computer or simulator. So I think that's one concern. Yeah, yeah one comment, yeah. Mm. And I think that's all. Uh, uh, we, I took the, the same picture that uh, Kang uh, did with the three of us. <clears throat> because it's this. Uh, yeah, Julia. Julia, I didn't understand this picture. This so, picture. So, the so, the, so the, the things that you can do with a quantum computer will be DQP. Oh, yes, it's written that. Yes, 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 yes. I also took a, a couple of more, more slides from Hank. Uh, this line, is, because I like it, is a balancing on breaking branches. I think uh, it's completely right. And also the one that also uh, surprised me, that was, that has been a very much a comment before. So I don't know if, um, do we do we finish or um, okay. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> do we have more <laughs> questions? Any from, from your side? <laughs> Any question? Yeah, I think my question on this was already asked yes, by yes, you. Yes, 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 yes. yes. <laughs> Yes, I had a question that was already, uh, uh, I mean, uh, 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 presented an answer. So, okay. <laughs> okay, so okay. then I think we can conclude. We can conclude. Okay, let we okay. let us thanks the the people at the MITP for for making this possible. Um, thanks to all the speakers and all the all the people here. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'll, thank I'll you see, all. I'll see you around. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. Very much. And we should also thank the organizers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Uh, many, many work thanks to the organizer. It was a great idea and a great workshop. Thanks so much. And on behalf of MITP, we would like to thank you as well. Uh, to, on participating on this workshop, and we really hope that we can um, host you in in presence uh, in Minds one day for one of the uh, workshops to come. This would be great. So thank you very much for having us hosting your workshop. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye. Bye.